I think it's it's just important to sort of set the context for what I think would be a perfect definition for a creator. I think it's anybody who has the ability to share what they know in a very succinct way, whether that can be through a course, whether that can be through an outcome, which is probably a tangible good or an art piece, or it could be a book, like anything that you can convert as something that you're passionate about. And then you can convert that into something that's monetizable and there's an exchange of value. You probably are a creator and the monetization part we'll come to later, but most creators start off with a specific passion. Hey everyone, welcome back to the Millennial Investing Podcast. I'm your host, Robert Leonard, and with me today, I am joined by Varun Balsera. Varun, welcome to the show. Lovely to be here. Thanks for having me. To start off our conversation today, give us a little overview of how big the creator economy is and what the creator economy market is. For sure. I mean, maybe let's start with like what exactly is the creator economy or the passion economy. And to sort of summarize it in a few words, it's basically think of it as a opportunity for anyone who is really interested in something, be that a hobby or a personal project, and the market rewarding that person for pursuing that project. And it could be anything from monetizing how to teach someone how to do origami, or it could be as far intricate as how do you actually trade in options or derivatives on the stock market. And so it's this whole unique way of thinking of careers now and thinking of like side incomes and being able to pursue those passions and get paid and rewarded for it. You know, as of 2022, the creator market size is estimated to be over about 104 billion and it's more than double of what it was uh, in 2019. And then, you know, there was a study published in August 2022, I think by Adobe. It just suggested that the creator economy has grown by over 165 million people globally in the last two years, which is an increase of about 119%, right? It is a very, very, very growing economy. And it's a very exciting space to be. Lots of activity happening in this space as well. How does somebody, let's say maybe they have a passion or something they think they would want to do online, but they just don't know where to begin. How should they get started? Where, where should they get started? I think it's, it's just important to sort of set the context for what I think would be a perfect definition for a creator. I think it's anybody who has the ability to share what they know in a very succinct way, whether that can be through a course, whether that can be through an outcome, which is probably a tangible good or an art piece, or it could be a book, like anything that you can convert as something that you're passionate about. And then you can convert that into something that's monetizable and there's an exchange of value. You probably are a creator and the monetization part we'll come to later, but most creators start off with a specific passion. And then they think about monetizing it later on. If we have to work backwards, you know, where the best place to start is, I have this framework called the coach market fit. And you can remove the coach with course or expert. It's sort of a derivation of what we talk about in the startup world, which is like product market fit, right? A product is said to have product market fit when the product is in alignment with the market that it serves. And so you usually start out as a creator or as an expert just asking yourself, like, what are the things that you really, really love to do? Whether that's podcasting, whether that is speaking and interviewing people, whether that's singing, dancing, teaching people how to do stocks or finance or property investing. It doesn't matter what it is. It's just about defining, like, what is it that gets you alive? And there can be a couple of things. Uh, but then on the other hand, if you want to be a little smart about it, you want to probably work backwards and say, well, is this specific thing that I'm creating also going to add some monetary value to my life? And most people want to have that side income, want to have that, that sort of side hustle, or maybe want to go complete in their side hustle at some point. So then you start thinking about, okay, so if this is what I'm passionate about, what is it that the market really wants to learn from me? Or what is that specific thing in the market that's missing that I can then provide? And so then you do a bunch of things. You do primary research, which is basically talking to your specific audience. So if people want to learn property investing from you, and if I have absolutely no experience in property investing, would people really want to learn from me? Probably not. So then I would sort of start asking people, what's the, what do they really want to know? What's their struggles? Where are they really not focusing their energies on? Where do they want to learn a specific 
outcome or a specific skill set or is there something that's lacking out there? Once I have that, then I start understanding what that coach market fit really looks like or that course market fit or X market fit looks like. And that intersection between what I'm really passionate about and what the outcome or the market really wants to learn from me or that wants to buy from me, that's that specific intersection, which is going to basically get me my passion, but also monetize that passion really effectively. And that's, I think, is that sweet spot. So where do you start? It's a very simple thing. You put out a piece of paper, you say what you're passionate about, you then ask yourself, what are the different things that people have asked me to probably speak on, guest lecture on, podcast about? Go talk to those people, ask them what they're probably struggling with, and then create a product that will then serve those people. And then the best form of validation, put it out there and see if they buy. If they do buy, you're probably onto something. What if someone doesn't have a large social media following? What if they don't have any social media presence really at all, but they have this idea and they want to put it out online? How can someone with no prior social media experience or following really get their idea out there to try and monetize everything you were just talking about? Yeah, I mean, so many different ways of doing it. And I think like you might be really underestimating how many followers you are, or rather overestimating how many followers you actually need to sell something online. We've worked with people and we'll get into that in a little bit, of course, but we've worked with people and seen people succeeding with just a few hundred or a few thousand followers. It's not like you have to be in the millions to actually sell something. And if you have absolutely no idea where to start, I think a great place to actually ask yourself where you want to begin is to understand where your audience is hanging out. So for example, if I'm someone who is targeting professionals, the best place to actually start hanging out is on LinkedIn, right? You probably want to start creating some kind of content that shows that, okay, this person actually exists. This person is really sort of knows what they're talking about. And I don't mean you post every day, but you can post every other day. And the best strategy is actually standing on the shoulders of giants. So the best thing that I like to do is, you know, when someone comes to me with that same thing saying, oh, Varun, like I have no idea where to begin. I don't even have a large audience. I say, who are your top three influencers in your field and where do they hang out? Great. Now go and post value bombs on their social media posts. What this basically does is you're adding value to them. So you're getting recognized by that industry leader if they comment on you. But even if they don't comment on you, you still have eyeballs on that specific comment. So if you're posting something that you're truly passionate about, that you truly believe will add unique value, then people are bound to listen to you. And that's almost how you, you sort of shortcut your way into growing your audience. Same thing applies for like a YouTube, same thing applies for like an Instagram with a few nuances, but you start with that community element. You start building those three to four to five, maybe loyal fans that really, really want to support you. And chances are, if you've lived fairly long enough, what I mean by that is like, if you've gone to school, if you've had genuine social connections with people, your WhatsApp phone book, your Facebook, you know, friend list is more than enough to start with. You can actually make thousands of dollars just by figuring out who you're selling to. And the chances are that the person that you're selling to is sitting right now in your phone book and you just don't know about it. And so reaching out and rekindling old connections, talking to people and being open about, hey, look, this is what I'm providing. This is the value I'm giving you. And then seeing whether people pay for that is just a great place to start. When it comes to social media, how often does someone need to be posting? Some people believe in quality over quantity, so you don't have to post that much, but it just has to be really high quality. Other people, maybe Gary V, would say hey, something along the lines of quantity is quality or can be quality. So how do you think about this? So I think consistency over anything else really trumps it. Like there's no guarantee that you can be qualitative or like have quality posts every single time that you post. and on the flip side of it, if you just post stuff that's very generic or cliched and you don't have your own voice, no one's really going to listen to you. And so the balance is up to you how you want to strike it. But I would just say consistency. And when you don't have a big audience, the best place to actually start, two best places, one is actually in the DMs. Like a lot of the people that succeed in the creator space have a great following. But a lot of them also, what you don't probably know is that they actually sell a lot in the DMs. So coaches, experts, consultants that are doing seven figures, eight figures a year, what they do is they hire a lot of sales representatives that actually start messaging people online. And so the genuine connection that is built is actually in the DMs. That's number one. Number two, if you don't know what to post, just start by engaging with people in that specific industry. 
just as an example, if you're in the in the product space and you want to help people break into product management and you don't have that much of an audience, you follow people in that same space who do have a great audience and build relationships with them. So you can start diverting, not diverting, but like speaking to people within their audience to say, hey, look, I exist. Why don't you come and follow me and I will give you more information. But equally, what's interesting to note is the third thing that we're seeing consistently is people are moving away from being solely reliant on platforms. And what do I mean by this is people are making sure that they have their social presence just to show people that, hey, look, I exist, I'm legit. But where the actual value add comes in is through getting and building your own email list. And there are tons of studies that show that like a great solid marketing list actually leads to higher conversions when you're selling products. And this is more important than ever when it comes to you dealing with the creator economy space. Because right now, tomorrow, any social media platform can change the way in which people are viewing your content and are following you. An algorithm change can basically make your traction go way up or way down. And so what people are realizing is that why social media might give you that initial push, what's really valuable is actually having an email list, which I can own and I can call my own without having to rely on any other social media platform to actually drive traffic for me. And in that process, you're actually seeing a lot of people build their own email lists and send out newsletters, for example, on a very regular cadence. And that's how they start building their audience. I know this has happened to me in the past. I think there are a lot of people that are like me, but they want to have everything done or perfect before they really launch. And I think I've gotten better at this over time. I've heard a lot of talks about how people say that you should be kind of embarrassed by your first version of your product or your website. So I think I've gotten better at this, but I know that there's a lot of people that struggle with this. They want to have everything done. They want to have everything built. They want it to be perfect before they actually launch. So how, how do you approach that? What advice or feedback do you have for people regarding this? Should they make sure everything's done, ready to go, perfect before they launch? Or should they just see if they can get signups first and then build it after? Should they pre-sell? What do you, what do you think on this? Yeah, this is what we say all the time, right? Like done is better than perfect. It's almost always the case. And here's why. You know, this is age old saying that says build and they will come. And if you follow that advice, you, you're very, it, there's a very strong chance you're going to fail. And that's equally true for most things that you do even in the startup space of building product. I'll give you a very interesting example. So we had a creator once who had built a massive audience in a specific geography. And he just suddenly decided to sell his course and his learnings from that community into a completely other geography. And he made absolutely zero sales. He refocused his efforts back into like selling to his own community and he sold out his course. So there's something to be said about like just going out there, of course, knowing where you're selling and who you're selling to, that's important. But after you do that, don't let that become like a place where you procrastinate. Because very often when we talk about this whole coach market fit thing, people will start saying, oh, you know, I've not really started to actually find that coach market fit. Let me do a little more research. And so you almost use that as an excuse to procrastinate. And so what we say is you start selling first, right? Don't even create stuff. You have a general outline of something. You start selling and marketing it just to understand whether people are buying it. Because hopefully you're not someone who's going to rip somebody off right? You are going to deliver a great experience. But the delivery of great experience is usually easier than selling and marketing for most people. And so creating and so for example, marketing and selling is usually what comes first and then building comes second. And I know this is something that most people feel really uncomfortable about. But when you really understand it, what selling and marketing does is you're validating what your offer is. And if somebody is saying yes to paying you for that offer, then it's your job to actually give them a great experience. And if you don't, that's on you. But almost when people start putting that faith in you, then you start realizing, okay, maybe there is something. So a very clear example of this, if you want to build a course, right? I'll give yourself maybe four weeks, five weeks, depending on, on different variables. But let's just say you have to launch a course in five weeks. You would have a general outline of what you want to teach them and the learning outcomes that somebody wants to sort of, you know, what they were going to get once they're done with your course. That should be enough to convince someone whether to come in or not. Because the content and what you're going to teach is what they're going to do after they sign up to you. So you need to perfect the first process before you even start the second process. And that is why I always say like market and sell and then build. Because building the experience, actually, you get a lot of insight when someone signs up. Because one of the things that you can start doing is start interviewing people. 
hey, thanks for signing up. What do you like? What do you interest? What are you expecting to do? And then you can keep tweaking your actual content to then best serve the people that have actually given you their hard-earned cash. Going back to this idea of someone not being big on social media or not having a big following, how else should they market? What other sales funnels or marketing funnels could and should they use? So in terms of like, just if you're, if you're just absolute beginner, absolutely starting out, like ads is usually almost the worst way to start. I'm going to quickly rule that one out. It's an easy answer, but it'll break the bank. So unless you're willing to spend thousands of dollars on, on marketing through channels like Facebook and YouTube, I would completely advise against that. What I am going to advise is something that's a little more tedious, but it usually sets the tone, which is consistent posting, which is very important because as soon as you start reaching out to someone, people will want to know you exist online and you're legit. I don't mean go and set up a website. I just mean simply have a presence where your audience hangs out. So for example, if it's real estate and you figure out that people are on Instagram or LinkedIn, and depending, let's just say it's real estate for, I don't know, C-suite executives. Most of the times, they're probably going to be on LinkedIn. And so if you've identified that, then try and build a persona on LinkedIn. Again, you don't have to have thousands of followers. A few hundred is great to start with. But then once I'm done with that, then I start again, start commenting where the industry experts hang out. So start commenting on their posts and then start serving their posts. A lot of the times, the people that comment on posts are the ones that are super engaged with that specific topic. And so starting to build relationships within the ecosystem, within LinkedIn, for example, by shooting a DM and genuinely getting to know that person, build a relationship with them, build a rapport with them, and then say, hey, look, this is what I'm planning to do. Are you interested? That actually leads to so many more sales. And we've, for the majority of our first year in business, that's actually how we sold what we're building today. And it was its relationship, it's permission-based marketing, right? At the very outset of it. And so like that really is beneficial. Yes, it takes time. It's a volume game, but it does set you up for great success because you start building your audience over time like that. So it is a bit of working hard, but at the same time, it actually sets you up. Once that is done, then of course, there are different things that you can do, right? Then there are three major funnels that you can use. And just, just to sort of clarify what that means for your audience, a funnel is basically where people come in, or they usually get something for free. And then it's almost like they're going through a journey uh, with you to buy a specific product. Usually the end outcome of a funnel is a purchase. So typically what people do to get someone to sign up on their emails, for example, is to give them a freebie or a free resource. And then once that is done, there are emails that are triggered to say value-driven emails that you send out. And then there's a launch of a course. And then value-driven emails and then a launch of another product. That's sort of the usual way a lead magnet functions. The other way, if you start developing and if you're starting to make revenue for your whatever your creative business is, then a webinar funnel works even better because we've seen the webinar funnel work great because you basically send leads, which are people who are interested in you. So that's usually through running either a Facebook ad or just building an audience and saying, this is a webinar. You get them onto a webinar, you provide them with value. And then towards the end of the webinar, you tell them, hey, look, this is what I'm selling. Would you be interested? And if you do a good job of it, most of the times people land up paying you on the spot or they book a call and then you sort of sell them on the call, depending on, this works really well for like coaching and consulting services. And the final thing is a, you do the same thing as a webinar, but it's more like a pre-recorded webinar. We call that the VSL funnel, which is the video sales script where people come in, they see what you have to offer they then book a call with you. And then as soon as they book a call with you, they have this call. You explain to them what the product is, what the offer is. Listen to what they have to say and then provide your services or solution as a way to combat that problem that they have. And that usually leads to a sale. So these are the couple of methods that you can potentially try out. But again, I would always start with the messaging because that is the most effective way to genuinely create those first five to 10 clients that genuinely become your true fans. Because guess what? If you do a great job with the first five or 10 people that sign up to whatever you're doing, they're going to be your most avid fans that will then shout about you and get you more customers. And so don't skip that part. And you know, many people get lazy with it, but the ones that actually succeed have done a really great job at having that genuine connection with people. 
how do you balance giving away content for free versus the content that you monetize? Should you be giving away everything for free? And if you do that, then how do you monetize? Like, let's say you have an online course. How do you balance what to give away for free and, and what to put in the course and behind a paywall? Is it just different packaging? How do you think about that? This is a, a lovely question. Just like we spoke about course market fit or like a coach market fit, there's also a content market fit. And you're right. You don't want to basically lose out on people by talking about fairly generic stuff. Because if you don't have a voice, then you're never really going to attract the right kinds of people. So if you do decide that like content is the way to go and like I'm going to develop a personal brand online, one of the key things to actually start by doing is like, okay, what do I want to talk about? What is already being spoken about? And then what do people really want to hear? And then you find gaps within those and then you fill them up with valuable content. I wouldn't worry too much about giving away valuable content for free because let's face it, like when you, when you start chatting with ChatGPT, a lot of the content that comes out of there is pretty valuable stuff. People aren't really paying for content anymore because that's almost like a thing of the past. What people are paying for is for you to help them out and for you to fast track their journey through your experience. And so what people really pay for is accountability. What people are really paying for is the ability to have that conversation with you and to execute, not necessarily to give content. So I wouldn't worry too much about giving valuable content that you're going to teach on the course. What most of the best creators, course creators, coaches, give all their information for free. You can get it online for free. But why do they still do very well? Because A, they've already developed that trust and they've given that content for free and it's valuable and it's helped people. And the next thing is, while I can give you that content, I don't think or I don't guarantee that you're going to actually implement that. And so then what you really pay for then is the implementation, execution and accountability. I hope that sort of clarifies it. How should creators, online content creators today, be using ChatGPT to benefit them? And then on the other side, the inverse side of this, how could it negatively affect or potentially disrupt the industry of online content creators? I think a lot of people today are getting scared of, of ChatGPT. And like, there's almost like this existential crisis saying, oh my God, like ChatGPT is going to ruin me. But the thing is, ChatGPT is lowering the barrier for somebody to learn something, which actually is great news for creators because you don't want to spend your time. Like, even if I give you content, I can maximum charge you what? Maybe $100 if it's extremely valuable content. But where the actual money lies, and it goes back to my earlier point, is when I can actually help you implement that content in the context of your life. And that usually happens when you sit in front of a coach and have a one-on-one -on -one or in a group where you have community. That really can't be replicated by ChatGPT. So I would almost encourage everybody who's probably not using ChatGPT to start using it because it helps you push content out faster. And if you know how to use prompts in a nice, in a really, really smart way, and there is, we can get into that if you like, but there are like a tons of ways in which you can just leverage ChatGPT in a really, really nice way to get valuable content out there, right? Obviously make it your own, do your own research and all of that. But leveraging that, it, at the end of the day, it's a tool. And you need to be able to leverage that tool really well, which basically means that now newsletters, content, you know, you can write scripts for your videos, you can write actual copy for your emails that you're going to send out in your newsletters. All of that means you're saving on time time that can now be spent on higher leverage activities, which basically bring you more revenue, aka the coaching, aka the consulting, aka forming a community, all of those high leverage activities, which an AI, at least for now, can't really do. You're bringing people together. And that is very powerful. Accountability is powerful. Being able to create in a space with other people, get valuable feedback, that is super helpful. And because the feedback is not just a text-based chatbot telling me, okay, do this, do that, but it's also social cultural, right? Like if you sit in like a course, which is with participants from around the world, you're also getting their experiences. And that is very difficult to replicate. So yeah, I mean, use ChatGPT because it helps you get done with the lower leverage tasks. But the higher leverage tasks, it frees up time for that specific uh, tasks that you can do that will actually bring in more leverage and therefore more revenue to your business. What are some of the most popular or most efficient and successful prompts that you think could be applicable for someone just starting out? 
one thing I've really realized is the ability for ChatGPT to become like your personal, like, I don't know, secretary. It's a super good way to do that. Like, so if you, if you characterize it as just that, you then also need to realize that it will do exactly what you tell it and no more or no less. And so what that means is if you leave anything up for interpretation, you're going to get a super, super generic response. So something that I love to do is I love to sort of study styles of people that are writing online on, let's just say, LinkedIn. So if I, if I love a LinkedIn creator, I will basically take that post and I will ask chat GPT to basically analyze the post and say, what did this post do really well? It'll tell me whatever, right? Now I've got chat GPT to affirm what it needs to do. The next prompt that I write is, hey, I've written this specific post. Can you now maybe emulate a similar style based your feedback above and rewrite this post for me? Now what you've done is you've contextualized what ChatGPT needs to do and you've given it a very specific prompt of what you then need to do. If you start thinking of using ChatGPT as a series of prompts, i.e. the prompts being the instructions, then what you're really seeing is a very nicely, very, very fast, targeted personal assistant just executing tasks. See, it doesn't really have a mind of its own. It will not understand stuff that intensely. But if you break it down into like the smallest possible component and tell it exactly what it needs to do, you will get a very good outcome. But if you say, write me a post on the five things you should be doing when you're podcasting, you're going to get a very generic response. Other than just chat GPT, what other tools or resources or tips do you have for online content creators to become more efficient and productive? Yeah, I mean, we could chat about GPT in a whole other podcast and happy to do that. But one thing that would be super cool to do is, and I've only started experimenting with this recently, is for example, when you, when you want to write content, you almost make ChatGPT interrogate itself. Let's just say I tell ChatGPT to write me a post. And I say, now critique your own post. It's going to give you a critique of that post. And then you say, hey, use your critique to rewrite me a better post. And you keep going back and forth. By the third or the fourth iteration, you have a really, really good post or a newsletter. And then very specific prompts that would be really interesting to start trying to use. And like, there's a lot of information out there online and I know it can get very overwhelming, but like just break it down into first principles. If you're talking to like a five-year-old child about certain instructions, how would you write or how would you talk to them? You almost want to use chat GPT in a similar way. Like instructionally, it's still a very infant. It doesn't, it cannot infer what you're thinking. It can only infer what you write. And if you write more specifically, you usually get a great outcome. So for example, if you want to write a really detailed comment on an influencer you really like, you can put what you think you should be writing and then say, hey, chat GPT, can you make this comment a little more snappier, a little more hilarious, or a little more dash, given what you think that person's going to like, and it will rewrite that for you. And then if you like it, use it. If you don't like it, you can always change it. But that self-interrogation part, I think was a game changer for me because you're almost getting ChatGPT to talk to itself and then keep doing it. So one of the things that we do at Let's Level Up, like one of the key things that we're actually building and it's in the works rather is you can now start creating your entire course content with a few clicks. Uh, so if you're, a, if you're a property investor, right? What you do is you give the system a prompt and you say, okay, I want to create a course on this. These are some of the topics I want to create. Uh, and then I hit enter and it will create an entire course outline with information within that course. And so what you're doing then is you're going into that course and just changing a few things that you don't think might be working or not. And so now what our system has done is it's fast tracked the journey for a individual from I don't know what to do, which I call the cold start problem, to now, okay, I have something to work with. And that's something to work with then can start becoming a lot more intricate and detailed. And so I guess the last way you can actually use ChatGPT, of course, if you're not using a tool like ours, is just starting with a prompt. So say, hey, I'm thinking of writing a post on X, Y, and Z. Can you maybe tell me what the structure of a blog on LinkedIn or a blog on Medium or a blog on Substack looks like? It'll give you the points. And then if you want to double click on a few points, you then go and ask ChatGPT, can you double click on it? And so by the end of it, you have all the information. Chat GPT has understood all the information. And then you're like, okay, so now can you write me an entire post? And so there you have it. 
You mentioned earlier in our conversation that consistency is such a, an important factor. How long do you think someone needs to be consistent or how reasonable, what's a reasonable timeline you think for someone just starting out to build a community and then most importantly, really get their first sale, their first dollar in their online content creation business? This is an interesting question because there's no right answer. And usually it's the various ways in which you can take this. And I say that because let's just say you're a 50 plus author uh, who's done really well for themselves, but does not use LinkedIn very often or Twitter and now wants to get into, you know, you're, you're fairly elderly. And so you don't have that kind of knowledge of how to use social media. But the fact is, you're a very successful individual and there are a lot of people already following you because they've read their books. Hey, everyone, it's Clay Fink here. Are you looking for an investment opportunity in a $2 trillion market? Look no further than Atacama, the cybersecurity industry's latest game changer. Atacama has opened its doors to U.S. accredited and international investors alike, already attracting over 5,000 investors and $6.5 million in capital. Atacama's recurring revenue model saw 10x revenue expansion in 2022 alone. They have patented technology and large contracts secured, including one with the U.S. Department of Defense. This is a limited time opportunity to get in on the ground floor of a rapidly growing cybersecurity startup. To learn more, simply visit invest.atacama.com WSB. That is invest.atacama.com. A-T-A-K-A-M-A dot com slash W-S-B. Full disclosure, I have personally invested in Atacama's equity crowdfunding round at a $29 million valuation. Please keep in mind that investments in early stage companies do contain risk. As with any investment, crowdfunding investments do offer attractive potential upside, but they cannot offer any guarantees of a future return. Now, if they come online on LinkedIn or Twitter, it's a short period of time if they, if they play their cards right to be able to then gain a massive following and then sell digital products. On the other hand, if, if you're relatively younger, you have nothing to show behind your name, as in like societal standards show behind your name and you have nothing sort of, no career really backing you and stuff like that, it might become a little more difficult in terms of a time frame to actually then start selling. But even then, we're seeing 18-year-olds, 19-year-olds, 16-year-olds are doing very well for themselves by selling digital products online. And I mean like educational products as well. It again depends on like how quickly you're able to figure out that creator market fit, which is like, who am I? Who's my audience? What's the best way to actually segment that audience and then narrow it down really specifically? And then can I start consistently building an audience around it or a community around it where people are actually following what I have to do? And can I build that meaningful connection with somebody or a few people to start off with? And so the, the faster you get to that point, the faster it will be. But there are no overnight successes. People have, people build audiences over time. Some people do it faster than others because they probably have a little more clarity and they've probably done a lot of groundwork without actually knowing about it. Quick example, if you are a struggling actor and you suddenly have a Netflix series, your Instagram account, if the Netflix series is great, is going to blow up. But you have put in a lot of effort to actually get to that point. You've done what it takes, right? And so very often in the content game, even in the creator game, you start seeing the creator really go slowly. And then there's something that they do. Their content gets shared. They sort of innovate on a, on a few strategies. And then you see them exponentially explode. It's a lot like podcasting, right? Like your first 10 episodes are probably going to fail. And then you, you sort of see that, oh my God, people are listening to me. Oh gosh, like I'm now, I'm hitting those numbers, right? Like that's the same thing that happened to me. Like I never thought I'd get into an Apple top 20 my podcast would get into an Apple top 20 chart. But then that consistency over time and like just having that love for the game, next thing you know, like you have a notification saying, hey, you're in the Apple top 20 charts. I'm like, so it's a small things that really, really, uh, you know, it's those small moments in time, the small steps that you take that if you zoom out over a period of time, you see so much growth. These days, so many different industries, topics are, are crowded and they're saturated. So. How does someone just getting in, how do they stand out from the crowd? What do they do to really establish themselves in this, in their chosen industry when there's already so many established creators maybe in their field? 
so this is this actually ties in a lot of what we've been speaking about earlier. One is the coach market fit, right? Like really figuring out who you are, what are you passionate about? And the best ways to do that, as I mentioned, just to quickly recap, go and figure out where you're being invited, who you're talking to, what do people really ask for advice from you on? And then the market, which is what is out there in that space that I'm really interested in? And like, can I do something really better or something very unique? And that better and unique could actually start off by being marginally better as well. You know, most of the times people keep thinking about it as like, I have to do 10x better. But like that 10x is an iteration game. If you don't start now by being incrementally better, you're never going to get to 10x. And like, that's the most frustrating part of like talking to someone who has that sort of, they're like almost chained by that thought is like, oh, I'm not 10x better than someone. Why would someone come to me? Well, you have to start somewhere. So just pick a lane and start and then you can pivot along the way. But if you don't start, you're never going to know what's going to actually happen. So just pick a lane and start. Of course, do the groundwork and then talk. Talk to as many people as you possibly can in your specific niche. So if you want to get into property investing, right? And if you have, say, 10 years in the, in the space and say there's an absolute newbie, you have 10 years worth of experience that you can showcase. And most likely that newbie is probably in your network. Your friend knows somebody. Your mom knows somebody. Your family friend knows somebody. And so you start with your phone book, right? And that's how you start getting that first, second client. Your testimonials will stack up. You start getting more referrals if you're doing a good job. If you're not doing a good job and if you have nothing to sell, then I would really question whether you, you're on the right track. But given that you have all of this in place, you can then start moving on and, and trying to find that complete differentiator. Saturation also is a very interesting concept because a lot of the times we have this limiting belief that we aren't good enough or that there's too many people in the space. But the truth of the matter is people are coming to you for you, right? And I, I love to say this because it's, it's what I call as like your unique you. Like what is that skill set? What is that? And it could be very simple things, right? Like, and there's another concept called the feature, not a bug, which is all the bugs that you think are in your body. I have a very ridiculous accent. I look a funny way. I talk a funny way. I have an uncomfortable giggle. I laugh in a particular way. Those are what you perceive as bugs, but that can actually be huge features for somebody else. So when somebody is listening to you and they go, oh my God, I love that accent. It's like, wow, okay, so you're actually building a niche around something that's unique to you and nobody can actually copy you. Again, you'll never find this out unless you have a very specific, not even specific, but like, as long as you start doing stuff, you automatically start knowing what's working and what's not. And the last thing I think is just having a contrarian perspective. I call it the, the CPOV, which is like the contrarian point of view, which is essentially, can I take a topic that I truly believe in? And do I have something to actually talk about, which most people will fight me on, but I can substantially validate. So just as an example, my contrarian point of view is you should start marketing and selling before you actually start making your course or your coaching program. Now, most people are going to say that's complete BS and like you don't know what you're talking about, but then I can pull out tons and tons of examples and I can give myself and I can back it up with revenue figures to show why that works and why that actually leads to a great student outcome. I have used this in my marketing methods and now this will obviously piss a few people off but what this is doing is it's also getting me people that actually really like me. And so in being, in being different, but not for the heck of it, but like, it's not a hot take. It's a genuinely different contrarian viewpoint. Don't be contrarian if you don't have anything contrarian to say, but figure out what that unique perspective is. And that is what people come to you for. So when people come and say, Varun, can you help me out? They get that I do this. It resonated with them. And now they want to learn. Rather than just, going vanilla and saying what everybody in the industry is saying. Because I'm pretty sure everybody has a contrarian viewpoint. They're just probably scared to speak about it. So hone in on that because that definitely becomes a differentiator. From all the people you've worked with, when someone comes to you and says that they're not really making progress or not hitting the goals that they want, what are typically the biggest reasons why they aren't getting as far ahead as they maybe should be or want to be? Honestly, two things. One is like just the mindset. People leave so much money on the table and it's sad because they're like, oh my God, I'm not, I'm pricing it too high when in reality, they're actually pricing it too low. There's like a lot of like that mindset around like charging people is a bad thing. And sort of that's one of the biggest limiting beliefs that people have. 
So a lot of the times it's a lot of mindset shift that we need to create with people. And the second thing is just a lack of consistency. Like, you know what you need to do. You have seen initial results, but now you've just got complacent because you think it's working and that machine's going to work for you. But guess what? Like you do have to still put in the work. And so if you're not doing those two things, most likely you're going to probably start hitting a plateau. And this is consistently what we've seen with people who struggle. And the third thing is they will do all of this. They'll get to a point where doing really well. So really well is maybe like making five or 10K in monthly revenue. And then they'll be like, oh my God, I can't handle demand. And then that's when it comes to the systems and actually the scaling of the systems. Like, how do I put the right systems in place so that I am not bothered about whether the backend technology is working, whether this is working, whether that's working. And like, how do I just consistently scale my coaching business or whatever my creative business is without the headache of technology? As we get towards wrapping up, tell us a bit about your own successful entrepreneurial journey. Tell us about your story and some of the top tips, advice, lessons that you've learned throughout your success building your own businesses. I think maybe starting off with like what I said earlier, it goes for the, the creative space as well. Done is always better than perfect in most cases. Of course, for some cases, it just doesn't apply. So like getting out there and just doing it and, and seeing what happens usually is a great, great way to start. I know most people say like do a ton of research and stuff like that, but like research and all happens along the way. The best second, uh, the best validation, whether your startup, your product is working is not usually a wait list, but is if someone can actually pay you for what you're actually providing. Uh, so if they can lend that hard-earned cash to you, uh, that's usually a proven metric for, okay, well, you're probably onto something. I guess the third thing would probably be focusing a lot on the consumer and the customer more than all the noise that's out there. Like you're going to get a ton of advice and that's great. You can say thank you to it, but you don't have to listen to everything that people say. Just focusing on like, is the customer benefiting? Am I adding a lot of value to my audience? And like just obsessing manically about that is usually when you build great businesses. And I think putting that customer first is, is a very, it's a very cliche thing, but often, more often than not, you'll see most people don't do it. And that's why they, they sort of kind of struggle. And yeah, I think both would be fall in love with the problem, not necessarily the solution. So most people say, you know, don't get too attached to the solution. I say get attached, but to the problem, because your solution is a method to solve a problem. It usually may not be in the first instance that specific. So like be adaptable to like pivoting as it comes. But yeah, genuinely love the problem uh, because that love for the problem will result one fine day in a great product. And if not, then you know that probably it's, it's, it's not a problem that you think is worth solving. And that's also okay. And I guess the last thing is don't take advice from someone who hasn't been in your place. Just as an example, right? Like if somebody tells you to do something and they're not really there yet, like just ask yourself whether that advice makes sense because they haven't gone through it. So what they're really probably doing is they're probably stuck in an echo chamber and just rattling advice that they have heard without actually going through it themselves. And so fundamentally, do you want to take advice from someone like that? Or do you want to take advice from someone who's a little ahead of you in the journey, who's gone through everything you've gone through, right? That's what actually makes coaching and just getting a coach and someone to help you out really, really a game changer because yeah, you're paying them money, but you're paying them money to help you fast track learning and your learning curves. So pay money if it, if it means that you're actually getting that help and fast tracking and make sure you spend it on someone who's actually been there, done that rather than selling you some fairy tale. Varun, thanks again for coming on the show. I really appreciate it. I know your time is super valuable. So I, th I appreciate you taking time out of your day to join me here on the show. For anyone listening that wants to connect with you, learn more about what you got going on, learn more from your resources, where is the best place for them to go? Where do you want people to find you? Sure. So you can always reach out to me at on LinkedIn. So I can share that link with you. It's Varun Balsara, V-A-R-U-N, B-A-L-S-A-R-A. You can email me on varun at letslevelup.io. And for a little more on what we do, we help uh, online creators, which are typically coaches and consultants, uh, scale their learning academies online. So we have the technology and we have the one-on-one -on -one support and tools to actually help you get there. So we're a full stack solution that helps you build 
different courses. So whether that's pre-recorded courses, coaching programs, one-on-one programs, and sort of create the entire sales funnel and the entire backend uh, tooling kit. So you're not worried about admin, logistics, all of that. Uh, so we streamline the entire process for you into one tool, replacing 10 plus other tools. So you can check that out if you're interested at letslevelup.io. Awesome. I will be sure to put that all in the show notes as always for anybody that's interested in connecting with Varun. You can find those links below in the show notes on your favorite podcast player or at theinvestorspodcast.com. Thanks again, Varun. It's been a pleasure. If you read a good book and you choose not to implement anything from it, then it was nothing more than a form of entertainment. I also think the books behind me represent all of the mentors that I've had conversations with in my own time. It won't be noticeable at first, but eventually you'll wake up in this different destination, health, wealth, happiness, and you'll be like, how in the world did I get here?